Well, good morning and welcome. I'm Robert Greenhill, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce a, an extraordinary panel for an extraordinarily important issue. The whole uh, question of technology and innovation runs throughout all the different sessions of the Summer Davos. And we know that to actually have uh, a smart economic future, as the presentation just showed, we need the right technology applied in a smart fashion. But that's easier said than done. How do we make sure that technological innovation is adopted swiftly and at scale? How do we ensure that business models are able to absorb and political models are able to understand the impact of, of innovation in terms of how they should be organizing themselves? How to deal with the unintended consequences of innovation for those people who don't have the skills or the abilities to keep up with that rate of change? And how to ensure that these benefits are, are shared equally and that the right investments can be made at a time of fiscal tightening and in a, in a time of frugality? How do we ensure that both the private and the public sectors can continue to invest in this important innovation? These are some of the questions that this panel uh, will be addressing with you over the next hour. And let me start uh, with Chairman Deng, who is the chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission of China. And Chairman Deng, of course, this whole issue of innovation is critically important to, to China. Perhaps you could share some of your observations with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in the macro perspective, the national innovation scheme is about institutional renovation and scientific innovation and development innovation and etc. In the past 34 years, China has achieved tremendous achievements with an annual growth rate of GDP at about 9.9%. And uh, the GDP per capita has increased from about 200 US dollars in 1978 to about 5,400 US dollars in 2011. So fundamentally speaking, this is uh, the result of sticking to the policy of reform and opening up and innovation. As for science and technological innovation, in the year 2006, the Chinese government made a policy about uh, improving the capabilities of indi indigenous innovation and building a country of indigenous innovation. And in this July, the Chinese government also convened the National Innovation Congress, raising the points of deepening the science and uh, technological institutional uh, reform and expediting the construction of uh, innovative countries. So this faced with a new landscape of economies and so China have uh, speeded up its uh, reforms in transforming the economic growth pattern. And so this has been served as a very important policy. And to speed up, as for the major principles of speeding up this uh, process, the first is to stick to the innovation-driven and service-driven. Secondly, we need to stick to the principle of uh, having the enterprises as uh, main bodies and to have the core energies from them for innovation. And third is to stick to the government support and uh, market orientation. The fourth is to uh, stick to the principle of, ha of having an overall consolidation and uh, arrangement. And uh, fifth is about uh, reform and uh, um, cooperation, reform and opening up and cooperation. So based on the above mentioned principles, we are going to mainly rely on the science and technological innovation and the managerial innovation to achieve China's sustainable development in the future. And we are going to lay emphasis on the following four aspects of work. The first is to perfect uh, the relevant uh, laws and regulations in order to promote the overall funding for the whole society in general in terms of R&D and uh, to 
uh, increase uh, multi-channel, multi-layer um, financial input systems building. Secondly, we are going to perfect the transformation of the scientific results into products and relevant policies, including strengthening the IP, intellectual property creation, utilization, and management and protection. While expediting the construction of the enterprise driven and the market driven and uh, the combination of the academia with uh, the practice and with uh, application and this kind of technological system. Thirdly, we are going to perfect the incentive systems for the uh, scientific people, including constructing the uh, personnel assessment system with orientation of the technical results and constructing an uh, innovative culture. Fourthly, we are going to strengthen the openness and co collaboration in the field of science and technology and to implement all-round, multi-layer, high-level science and technological international cooperations to support Chinese enterprises and companies and uh, scientific institutions to go overseas to set up their R&D centers and also encourage the international R&D inst institutions, universities and uh, multinational corporations to set up their R&D centers in China. And we are going to make our efforts to promote the collaboration or collaborative innovation between the Chinese institutions and the foreign counterparts and to share the innovation results of science and technology together. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Zhang. It's a very comprehensive perspective on the challenges. And Bill Green, is, as Chairman of Accenture, not only is Accenture very involved in the issue of innovation, but you've personally been very involved in the, in the questions of ed education, innovation, technological change. And you've noted some of the challenges of, of actually making these uh, real opportunities for innovation move forward in practice. Yeah, if I could just speak to that. I, you know, I, I had the honor of participating in a study for the National Academies in the United States, which was three business guys and 20 uh, Nobel Prize winners. I was one of the business guys. Um, and, and you realize the power our national research institutions in our developed countries have. It is unbelievable. But these innovations are, in my mind, trapped. They're under-recognized, under-leveraged. They have a hard time getting out. Um, they get focused in the science community, and we don't translate it into the business community. We talk in the certain developed countries about stimulus. We talk about shovel-ready projects. In a shovel-ready project, you get a swimming pool, right? A research-ready project, you change how the world works and lives. Over $40 billion in the U.S. alone goes into our funding of these institutions. And we have the talent, we have the know-how, and during the depths of the downturn, the thing that didn't stop was innovation but is in many ways trapped in the system. And so first is we have to recognize that we need to repurpose some of the investments we make to get the outcomes we want, as opposed to just outcomes. We have to recognize that the innovations aren't relevant unless they scale. And we have to figure out a way how to get momentum behind these. And then lastly, I think, you know, real invention happened and it's very much like the example in China, when government and the education infrastructure and institution and ecosystem came together to tackle some of the world's toughest challenges along the lines of basic research over multi-years. And I think the thing that we have to crack the code on right now is it needs to be governments and education ecosystem and business have to all be on the same page to make sure the funding is relevant or repurposed to be relevant, to make sure the outcomes 
are what we're trying to trying to create and to make sure it scales and make sure innovations know no boundaries, no company boundaries, no geographic boundaries. So, so, so this whole issue of the innovation trap, something that's developed in an institution not actually getting out into business or into the marketplace and not actually changing the lives of millions of people as it could. And I guess it's a little bit like if a tree falls in the forest but nobody hears it, you know. If, if an innovation takes place in a laboratory but nobody takes advantage of it, did it really occur in a way that's meaningful? Exactly right. So, Rintaro Tanaki, you as the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, you've overseen a lot of research in terms of how to actually make innovation work. And I think you were observing there's some interesting examples of countries who are trying to, in these difficult times, focus in the right way to achieve these kind of important innovation breakthroughs that Chairman Zhang was just talking about. Thank you. OECD, an internet, Paris based international organization, a kind of forum of public policy with 34 member countries, including China, as a key partner. Um, the OECD launched its innovation policy, innovation strategy two years ago and to promote comprehensive horn of government approach toward fostering innovation and economic growth. Our approach to the innovation is perhaps an, a bit broader. R&D is a quite important element, but not the sole driver of innovation. Perhaps in a complementary asset such as in software, human capital, and appropriate organizational structures are needed to make innovation, innovation successful. Indeed, investments in brand equity, design, organizational capital, business model allow companies typically operating in high competition, high cost environment to compete on other aspects than cost. For example, Evidence has demonstrated the introduction of organizational innovation, such as environment, new environmental management practice, can result in improved environmental performance and complement technological innovation. Along with this idea, um, not only OECD member countries, but also China, India, Brazil, as well as in some emerging and developing economies like in Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam has established national uh, innovation strategy. In the, as a, in the background of economic downturns, um, some countries has ring fenced public spending on research and innovation in order to preserve long-term innovation capacity. I'd like to stress two points in establishing a, a innovation policy, national innovation policy at this stage. First is, and I say, why supply-side innovation policy, such as R&D, are necessary to preserve long-term innovation capacity. But also, the national strategy should include demand-side innovation and diffusion policy. This is quite important, particularly on the crisis, in response to the crisis to address demand uncertainties. Demand uncertainties are quite essential. Secondly, recovery policies or innovation policy under the process of recovery, we shouldn't support failing sectors. It is quite likely, quite highly likely mistaken. Market forces will continue to weaken them and they will eventually face similar difficulties. Resources should be provided to sector with growth potential. In parallel to industrial policies that facilitate resource deployment. Here, policies that avoiding employment losses and supporting training is really essential to avoid damage to innovation systems. Such policies do not only matter from a social perspective, but also from the perspective of innovation the lack of enterprise creation to absorb unemployed workers. Also, the lower quality of matching skilled workers to adequate employment available during the session as well. And also, the importance of employees' tacit knowledge for firms' innovation process as the main arguments for employment support during economic downturn. 
very interesting. I mean, the, the, the two elements that really struck me there. One is this easy to say but so difficult to do element of investing in the future, building the future, not just trying to preserve the past in terms of where one invests. But the second, the balance between investing in innovation and diffusion in, in order to really be able to make a difference. And, and Susan Hockfield, as the present emerita of, of MIT and a visiting scholar at the Kennedy School uh, and foundation board member of the World Economic Forum, we're proud to underline, um, you've been deeply involved in this whole issue of not only developing technology, but actually making sure, or MIT's been well known for making sure that it actually gets commercialized and applied. What do you see as the lessons in doing that? What do you see as the key challenges in doing that going forward? Yeah, so it was um, an incredible privilege to sit at the helm of MIT to actually witness firsthand uh, how great economies are built out of innovation. And I think I, you know, I agree ferociously with my colleagues in what you have laid out as the key elements of, uh, you know, for strong and sustainable economic growth. I want to raise just a couple of um, perhaps cautionary notes to pick up on some of the themes that you've articulated. Um, the first is uh, funding of research. Absolutely critical, and I'm always delighted when I hear that particularly government is ring-fencing and protecting the funds that have been allocated for research. All of the great innovations that you know, we've enjoyed and that have been real drivers of economic growth have come from um, early-stage science and technology, and I understand the, uh, let's say, the passion for getting those discoveries out into the marketplace as fast as possible. I'll come back to that at the end, but um, but one of the things that often gets overlooked when we're interested in changing facts on the ground now or a year from now or five years from now is that fundamental curiosity-driven science and engineering research is what leads to technological innovations, but not tomorrow, 20 years from now. And if we bias our funding toward uh, those kinds of activities that will produce marketplace ideas soon, to the, at the expense of funding the early stage research, all we are doing is robbing Peter to pay Paul or robbing the future in interests of the present. So I just have to underscore the importance of a very broad portfolio of funding, government funding for the ma very major part, because no one knows which of those early discoveries is going to lead to um, you know, GPS technology or a new cancer treatment. You just don't know early on. So that's very important. Um, the second thing, you know, again, I, you know, I love it when my colleagues talk about the importance of education. Education is obviously key for the kind of innovation-based uh, growth that really leads to um, societal transformation. Uh, but education is changing. What is demanded of our workers is changing more rapidly than ever before in the world. And how we provide ongoing education, I think, is a very important issue. The major corporations are investing probably billions of dollars to train and retrain their employees, but that just doesn't work for the small and medium enterprises, which, as you all know, are largely responsible for jobs growth, um, I think, in all of our countries. And so one of the, I think, important uh, directions for education is preserving what has been the kind of traditional uh, in-person educational models, but I feel very strongly that we are just at the tipping point of new, a new style of online education that I think could be incredibly valuable, not just for the standard student, but for the uh, learner who's already in the workforce, who needs to develop his or her skills or bring on new skills. So I think that's an important direction that uh, many of my uh, colleagues in industry have seen as uh, critical for their ability to keep up with the future. Um, the last uh, thing I want to mention is connectivity. And this is, I think, where we all feel a bit stymied. We understand that there's an innovation pipeline that um, begins with curiosity-driven research and then you know, eventually gets to development. And that development of a new technology makes its way out of a research lab into the marketplace often to a small company that either that company grows or gets acquired by a larger company. But the problem is it just takes a long time. So how can we close the gaps? How can we accelerate that? And I personally believe, and this is based on you know, my experience at MIT, 
that one way those gaps can be shortened and the pipeline process going through tra traveling through the pipeline can be made more rapid is by a very much closer working relationship between industry and the academy, and it's what Bill talked about, a government academy industry partnership. Now, many of my colleagues in the academy would just um, kind of uh, be shocked and, and uh, quite horrified by the view that industry and the academy need to work more closely together. But I think at a time where the pace of change is accelerating, we're going to have to figure out how to bring the needs of industry and the marketplace closer to education mm -hmm. so that we aren't delivering uh, people into the, into the workplace, I mean from every level of education, who simply <clears throat> are not prepared for the challenges of today's industry. Mm -hmm. If I might just uh, follow up on uh, Susan's points. <clears throat> um, living across the river in Boston, I have great respect for MIT and all it does, particularly its advanced manufacturing program, global logistics, which are really practical ways of getting things out, out there, and including Media Lab and so forth. Uh, a couple of things. We've been working on this concept of demand-driven capability development, and I, it, I think it goes to Susan's point. Business can't sit there and say, we know what we like when we see it. Um, we have to go back down the pipeline. We have to help shape the outcome we want. And I use the word capability development because it doesn't have anything to do with, to, with degrees per se. It has to do with capabilities. And, you know, we tend to get tangled up in the degree programs, advanced degree programs, and all that is important. But at the end of the day, it's about certain skills and capabilities for people to do the jobs of tomorrow, not the jobs of yesterday. And in order to do that, we have to realign the education ecosystem to be demand-driven. And we have to, as business, we have an obligation, right, to reach into that system and help shape so it produces the outcomes we want that then we can invest in the great raw material to, to take it to the next level. I think the second point I'd just like to follow up on Susan's point, she's absolutely right about curiosity and the original research. I'm sort of in the, you know, one-third, two-thirds. I think we have an opportunity in two-thirds of our research to industrialize it a little. And I know those words are frightening to the research community. The word industrialize because it says consistent, predictable, process-oriented, and less experimentation. And it doesn't mean that. But if you look at the drug development process, one of the things that's happened in pharmaceuticals is we have industrialized more and more elements of it which have allowed us to get products to market faster. Maybe in a lot of different and more creative ways. Uh, but I think that one of the last, you know, islands of rationalization and productivity improvement, you know, has, we have to look hard and critically at our research and how we invent the future. Uh, and it goes very much to Susan's point, the speed of change right, is moving faster than our ability to accommodate it. So, Robert, I just want to take Bill's point and raise it okay. um, a little bit, which is uh, one of the, I would say, inefficiencies in these systems where there are handoffs is duplication. And uh, particularly in the world of biopharma, mm -hmm. um, if you have spectacular academic research labs and biopharma research labs that essentially duplicate that, that strikes me as probably not the best investment of resources. And this is why a new kind of collaboration, new styles of working together have to be developed, I think, between industry and the academy, mm -hmm. um, and industry and uh, the National Research Lab, or wherever research is yeah. taking place, yeah. so that we can um, uh, simplify. Right. I mean, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of duplication that's necessary to you know, get the right answer. But I think that um, we're kind of, we haven't really uh, thought through right. how to get high efficiency. Again, in the academy, you don't want to talk about efficiency, <laughs> right. uh, but efficiency of thought. And right. so you get the right people with the right insights and the right experience uh, integrated into the process earlier on. Mm -hmm. just, um, just two points to follow up, Susan. Um, despite the crisis and uh, tremendous pressure on public finance, uh, fiscal consolidation, um, some or many or many developed countries' governments maintained or even increased uh, the budget for to support 
research and development in the public sector. We should recognize many of recent or current breakthroughs derived from the knowledge obtained by the research and uh, this R&D in public sector. Also, so we should be mindful of the importance of supporting public sector activities in the area of innovation. So the, uh, in seeking of, of fiscal consolidation inside the government, we have to, be, uh, we have to continue to appeal this importance. Also, in the secondly, um, the research institutions is getting more and more entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, uh, gaining our entrepreneurship uh, spirits. This is not happening in the advanced economies like in the US and uh, France, UK, but also we, can, we observe such a strong tendency in emerging economies like Malaysia or Thailand. This is an, quite, quite clearly a global trend. So again, to move this discussion a little further along, um, Vice Chair Zhang uh, actually talked about a set of policies that I find enormously admirable. So there are it's funding for early research and the development, but critically important, critically important is as these technologies move out to further development, one of the things that I think we have to really think about is funding for long cycle businesses, capital intense enterprises. And um, you know, one of the things I worry about in the United States is um, how patient our capital you know, is, or how patient our capital should be for investing in uh, activities that have enormous marketplace potential but take a very long time. And China has done, I think, a really terrific job in uh, making the kind of long-term investments that allow capital-intensive, long-cycle industries uh, to really uh, take root and um, flourish and blossom. Mr. Chairman Zhang, would you like to comment on any of the observations? In this regard, China is still exploring. One is on the basic research over the long term, how and how to use it in a rational way with the uh, immediate uh, R&D from a sustainable development perspective, how to uh, use uh, the uh, laws of uh, uh, R&D and uh, also to continue the uh, strength and the uh, force of the investment. Also, the results of uh, R&D and uh, the application of their results must be better directed towards the market so that the enterprises can play their part. At this particular point, one of the problems in China is that R&D institutions and universities are conducting research and development mainly in order to be able to uh, write papers and uh, win uh, scientific awards. And uh, they are uh, not as strong on the uh, market-driven aspect or the market idea. So at this particular point, that's why we have uh, proposed on one hand we need to encourage the R&D institutions and the universities and the enterprises to have greater cooperation, to set up greater cooperation, because the enterprises are most familiar with the needs of the market. And so on technology R&D, we hope that they will be able to play a more active role. Thank you. What I take away from, from the comments is uh, four things. First of all, clearly this need of collaboration to ensure that uh, the expertise and perspectives from the different actors can be combined more effectively. Second is this issue of relevance, particularly to the marketplace. But I think, Susan, you brought up the very important third element of, of balance. We need to balance the short-term with long-term investing. We need to balance the role of education to develop citizens with its role to develop people can, who can be you know, effective economic uh, contributors as well. And I think that the, the, the fourth element, though, is this issue of renewal. We need to be able to renew our systems to be able to take into account the technologies. And it's striking today, well, of course, will be the launch we expect of the iPhone 5. And we think of the transformation that has been taking place with tablets and with smartphones over the last 10 years. On the one hand, 
On the other hand, I remember someone saying, you know, if somebody had fallen asleep 100 years ago and woke up today, they would recognize nothing in terms of the automobiles, the airplanes, the iPhones, the tablets. He, would he or she would recognize nothing except the schools. If they actually went to the primary schools, it would seem very similar to what they saw 100 years ago. And yet it's that link of the education system with the technology which allow us to go forward. So I think what you were saying, Susan, in terms of is there a whole new model of renewing how we actually educate one another, now the demand-driven capability building, but also these broader things through technology, is probably one of the key limiters or key enablers of how we actually use technology going forward. Let's open it up to, to the floor for uh, questions. We have a limited amount of time because we have an important set of announcements to make afterwards. So please introduce yourself, and then if you have a one-sentence statement, fine, and then a question, no more than 45 seconds, please. Sir. And we'll take two or three, and then I'll turn back to the panel. Please. Hello. Um, good morning. I'm from Xinhua News Agency Jin Economic Reference Newspaper. I would like to answer a question to Mr. Zhang. And uh, so yesterday we listened to the uh, reports about China's economic outlook, and uh, most experts are optimistic about that and thinking that in the future the Chinese economy is going to ha have a very large room for the policy to promote the economic recovery of all. Uh, uh, further, and uh, especially I would like to ask you one question, and so what are the relevant policies in your aspect? And uh, I would like to also ask the other, other panelists and for maintaining the sustainable growth for China, and how can we do the things in order to, not, uh, to avoid hampering the science and so technology please innovation? So questions related to the topic of, of innovation. <laughs> If, if you would like to, to interview Vice uh, Chairman Zhang afterwards, that would be a, another idea. But please keep the comments related to, to the, the issue we're discussing today. Please, sir, and then over here. Hi, Sam White from Promethean Power, a startup from Boston. Um, one of the things that uh, we've noticed is uh, the great research that comes out of uh, scientists from universities yeah. seem to uh, jump off the, uh, a, a vacant hill that uh, because there's no ecosystem to support these scientists after they graduate. So where are they physically going to continue their scientific progress uh, to, make, to make it into the market? That's interesting. Please, her at the back. Can, can, Bill, can I, can no, I no, just... Let's take two or three, then okay. I'm definitely going to come to that right. one. Thank you. I would like to ask Mr. Tamaki and uh, for China, in China's uh, financial output or uh, uh, input, and it is very large, and also it has this very clear target. And how do you view the Chinese government in terms of the financial support for the innovation? And the second, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Zhang, and yesterday Premier Wen mentioned that uh, a large inv investment is going to make uh, for China's sustainable growth. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Zhang what uh, this investment will be diverted to, uh, for example, whether it will go into innovation. Thank you. Take one more question, please, ma'am. Thank you. I have a question ask uh, uh, Mr. William Green. Uh, I know your company have a theme, uh, which means skills to succeed. So how can you uh, evaluate and uh, comment on the skills to succeed, the relationship with uh, smart growth and smart economics? So let's go through the, first of all, this, this issue, Susan, of um, not just a, an idea, how does it get out of, out of the university and succeed, but how about the person, the scientist, who comes out of MIT and then finds themselves in the world? What's the ecosystem to support them? Yeah, Very so interesting question. It's, it's a great question. And uh, you know, we talk about valleys of death in the development of products. I mean, there's valleys of death in the development of individuals. Um, and I, you know, I come back to uh, what I've said before about building closer linkages earlier on um, between industry and the academy. But I think one of the, um, you know, as I look at this problem of transferring people and products from the research lab into the marketplace, 
I often think of research uh, labs, research universities as having as being a place that just has baskets of solutions, and industry has baskets of problems. And how you match the problems to the solutions is actually a very, very difficult task. And it only happens through conversation because it's not clear that the, the solution builders have directed those solutions toward the problems that have been articulated quite precisely by industry. In terms of individuals and the ecosystem um, surrounding our research universities, if you look around the world at the places that are real innovation hubs, invariably, there are places with strong research universities, got a plethora of startups and some of the big companies, and figuring out how to make that ecosystem actually full of communication networks, I think is a challenge that remains. We do pretty well at it in Cambridge, but you know it's far from perfect. Um, and there are too many um, people who really struggle as they you know, leave our campuses to start businesses that you know, can't find the capital, can't find the mentors, can't find the first rungs in the ladder. And um, at MIT, we've established a number of processes to help facilitate um, that, but it's, it, it's a hard uh, issue, and I think it's something that we're continuing to work on. That's it. I mean, it, that strikes me as a great opportunity go, going in forward on this. And Ritar, on the, on the, on the question of, of China's innovation in, in investments. Yeah. And um, we have received a question about Chinese economy and its uh, sustainability. Um, in terms of uh, um, the, uh, first of all, I, I like to stress the Chinese economy is not an independent economy. Um, at least we can say China, Korea, Japan, and other ASEAN countries has formed a combination of very effective economic ties. And uh, for example, when China's exports grows, Japan's exports to China grows. The, uh, each of the economy has a quite high correlation. Um, so in that sense, the sustainability of Chinese growth is quite essential to anyone. Secondly, um, we have been advocating the shift of demand, demand element in Chinese economy from investment to consumption. But now, I stress we have to think about the change of export-led growth model to more domestic-oriented, innovation-oriented, growth model. Mm -hmm. And we are now looking at, at the OECD, um, knowledge-based capital as a new source of growth. Um, perhaps uh, China has uh, a great potential to accumulate knowledge-based capital. This would make uh, uh, the future base of the Chinese sustainable economy. Of course, in looking at the economic data, we have to look at, uh, say, gross components, export, investment, consumption, etc. But uh, uh, they look at the, the substance of the, uh, the each of the demand elements. We should put more emphasis on knowledge-based one. And uh, in, this, in this sense, Chinese, Chinese public sector still maintains uh, its soundness and has an loom, ample loom to divert physical as a expenditure for physical expenditures to more innovative capital knowledge based expenditures. So the important element is, is China actually has policy options that probably aren't available to other countries in terms of it can actually it has space to allocate additional or reallocate so. assets to, to some of the innovation elements we were talking about. Vice Chairman Zhang? Yes. Uh, so just now I mentioned that for the time being, China's economy is also faced with the difficulty of the international market and the shrinking demand from the international market. So we pay more attention to the innovation-driven model. So in this July, we convened the Innovation Congress and raising a series of policies in the late, in late July, we issued uh, the 12th five-year plan and the innovation strategy for the different sectors, including energy conservation, um, 
biology and a new generation of uh, the manufacturing new energies and the new energy vehicles. Uh, the seven spheres, and the, there are going to be the specific policies targeting the seven, uh, seven fields. And in this August, uh, we also have the energy conservation policy renewed. And saying that uh, there is going to be about uh, uh, 3.6 trillion yuan for the key project uh, in terms of the new energy. Secondly, I think either for the new sectors or new or the fundamental R&D. On the one hand, we need uh, the further investment from the government, but we shouldn't, at the same time, we shouldn't completely depend on the government. I also mentioned just now that we should give more role to the enterprises in the aspect of innovation, either for energy conservation or the new generation of the uh, IT information or the biology or new energy. And I think the enterprises, if they think that there's going to be a good prospect for the government, and they should uh, strengthen their investment in R&D on those areas of their interest. Besides, and looking at this year, yesterday, yesterday Premier Wen Jiabao mentioned that our heavy industry is developing uh, kind of slow, slower, and about uh, the industry is uh, satisfying the market demand are developing more quickly, and the emerging industries are developing more quickly, while the traditional ones are kind of left behind. And uh, the statistics I read, I read, including the energy conservation and the uh, high-end uh, equipment manufacturing and new generation of IT technologies are, are developing very quickly. And uh, due to the efforts of the enterprises themselves and the support from the government, and uh, also we have more diversified support mechanisms and channels, including some uh, venture capital and foundations, or sector-based foundations to support innovation. It's very interesting that, uh, Mr. Chairman Zhang, that with, with the point that you noted that, that Premier Wen Jiabao had made, which is during difficult times, it's the innovative companies and it's the innovative industries that are actually succeeding, suggests that with that and with the policies, the pace of innovation could actually accelerate. It's, it's interesting because the conversation's been looking at, at national policy, but it also comes down very much to the individual. The individual who's involved in creating the innovation and then the individuals who are actually needing to uh, absorb or adapt or react to the innovation. And so well, I want to come back to the question that was asked around the ideas of skills, but I also want to link it back to you, any thoughts you had on, on Susan's comments about this. What does one do with these great graduates to actually make sure they can become great contributors as scientists or engineers or others. But also, how does one equip and empower other individuals uh, to, to deal with these new technologies? Well, I guess so. there's a couple of questions there, but let me, let me first go to Susan's uh, answer and the question out here. Um, I think we, you know, we, the human condition is to live in a siloed world. And I think that is absolutely true in the education system. I think there's people that do research um, that are mentored by another researcher and their aspiration is to do that. And I don't think we've exposed to the talent, right, the possibilities that are out there. Because incredibly bright people can do incredibly profound things. Right? And, and when, I look, when I look at a business person, at the talent at MIT or other institutions. I'm drooling, right? Let me get my hands on these people. I need to be able to articulate to them their possibilities that are greater than just in the silo they're in, but are profound across being able to impact industries and being able to impact people's lives. And I think it goes back to Susan's very well-made point about collaboration and connecting. And me having an opportunity to describe opportunities, right, that are available out there to solve the basket of problems uh, by these people that are problem solvers. I mean, sometimes we make what is incredibly simple really complex. But I, I think second to that, I mean, 
there's two things that we have to focus on. One is we do need to reinvent the delivery systems of the world. And the education example that you laid out is very straightforward. Delivery of innovation, delivery of education, delivery of health care, delivery of public services. Our delivery systems are at a breaking point. And the good news to me is that the invention of the next delivery systems is not going to happen in the developed markets. It's going to happen in the developing markets because the problems are so intense and yet they have a clean sheet of paper in many ways to, to, to solve them. And that is incredibly energizing. And once those are done, we will learn how to refit how you educate 850 million people in India under the age of 17 We'll learn how to refit that to places in the United States. But the second thing, and just to the question in the audience, you know, as a company, we're a human capital company. We have a program called Skills to Succeed. And if, and if you believe my premise that we have innovation that's trapped, and we do, we could profoundly improve the productivity of agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa right now with technologies that have been on the market 10 years. So it's like really straightforward. But not only do we have innovation that's trapped, we have people that are trapped. And they're trapped in their community college system. They're trapped in their communities in countries around the world. There are people that are saying, put me in, coach. I can learn. I'm a motivated learner. And so we as a company feel we have an obligation, and that's what our Skills to Succeed program is, is to make people job ready, ready to start a small business, Right? We committed to make 250,000 people around the world that way. We are ahead of schedule. Of course, we count and Accenture. We count everything. And it just says that in the meantime, right? well, we're figuring out how to reinvent the delivery systems of the future. We have the opportunity to unleash talent that is right in our hands. And some of it's leveraging a little technology. Some of it's leveraging a little process. Some of it's just leveraging a little inspiration. And we have the power as companies, as educators, as institutions to unleash that and buy us some runway and get us some pro, you know, process and some productivity and to raise the game of the people in the world and raise the water table in the tank. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're solving for, rising standards of living, require productivity improvements, and productivity improvements aren't just technology and innovation, it's just unleashing trapped talent that I think we have in our communities all over this world. I think that's a great summary of, of both challenges but also the opportunities. We're at the end of our session because we're actually about to honor some of these individuals who have made those links between the laboratories and, and the world and the real world problems, but before we do that, let me just see if there's any last comments. That, that any of our, our panelists would like to give. Otherwise, let me, on behalf of everyone here, thank you for this great conversation. I think one of the uh, key points I took away to, Bill, was your last one, which was actually emphasized by the comments of Vice Chairman Zhang, which is, in the future, not only markets and growth are going to be focused in emerging economies, innovation is as well. Because this is where the greatest challenge are, but actually this is where the greatest collection of human capital is. Mm -hmm. So this will be, year after year, surely at the Summer Davos, the place that we're going to see some of the most exciting innovations. Designed in China, designed for the world, and designed actually in all the other uh, emerging nations that are participating as well. So on behalf of uh, the World Economic Forum, please join me in thanking this great panel. Now. This panel is, is actually setting up an important demonstration. I'm going to go over here. Because some of you may say, well, this is actually fairly theoretical in terms of actually what's going on. How, how can actually technology help improve the world? So we actually have 18 little case examples that we want to share with you. These are our technology pioneers. The technology pioneer program has a competitive process to actually identify the most exciting companies who are applying science and technology to help address real world problems. And we try to identify them at the early, in some cases even pre-commercial stage, so that we can actually honor what they're doing, but actually the point that was made here, we can help connect them more quickly and more effectively into the global ecosystem, so people can understand what they're doing 
and the potential they have to actually help improve the state of the world. Past winners of the award include Google, it's done pretty well since, Twitter, Mozilla, Dr. Redder's Laboratory, MBA Polymets, and a number of that you'll see today, which I hope five years from now will be household names. So what I'd like to do is simply introduce each of them and in one sentence try to describe what it actually represents years of passion and creative engagement. And I'll be doing this um, by uh, alphabetical order of, of the organization. And I'd like to start with Juan Alberto Yepes of AlienVault. AlienVault provides an open source web security platform enabling the collaborative sharing of information and solutions to security threats and vulnerabilities. And Xu Ming, Wei Li Gu of, of sorry, Xu Ming of Han Hui Li Gu New Energy Technology, which actually develops an, an intelligent battery management system for electric vehicles that enables improved energy efficiency, battery life, and safety. And next, Tom Brown of Azuri Technologies, which affords affordable and clean, and clean pay-as-you-go solar power, enabling people in poor communities who are off the grid. And Raghu Balur of Enphase Energy. Enphase Energy develops microinverters for solar cell systems, which allow for maximum energy conversion and output. I'd now like to uh, invite Jake Leshley of Ingenuity Systems which is a knowledge database that untangles complex relationships and connections that enable viruses and diseases. This allows researchers to better collaborate, one of the key issues, and make decisions that accelerate scientific discovery and drive R&D productivity in pharmaceutical and biotechnology research. And now I'd like to introduce James Dung of Lancetech. Lancetech develops breakthrough technology using genetically modified bacteria that converts carbon monoxide into ethanol and other useful chemicals. Now, next, Roger Hine of Liquid Robotics. Liquid Robotics designs self clean, self-powered, and propelled research vehicles that scan the oceans for critical oceanic and meteorological data at a fraction of traditional methods. Now, of course, as I'm doing, you can see up on, on here in examples of some of the different cool things these guys are all doing. And next, Kevin Mahaffey of Lookout Mobile which is a smartphone security company that provides protection for mobile devices from external threats and attacks, as well as remotely controlling and retrieving data. And now I'd like to introduce David Icke of MC10. MC10 has pioneered flexible and conformal electronics that can stretch, bend, and twist seamlessly with the natural world. And next, Ryan Howard of Practice Fusion. Practice Fusion provides a fully comprehensive WEG-based electronic health record system to physicians addressing the complex needs of today's healthcare providers. <laughs> C. 
Sam White of Promethean Power Systems. Promethean Power Systems has developed the thermal energy storage system that eliminates the need for diesel generators for cold storage applications in developing countries. And I suspect an MIT graduate. Oh, uh, businessman. <laughs> I'd now like to, to invite Rafael Savendra of RightScale. RightScale cloud management enables organizations to easily deploy and manage business critical applications across public, private, and hybrid clouds. Aaron Amy of Shopkick. Shopkick is bringing new capabilities to physical world retail by using mobile phones to reward consumers for valuable actions, such as interacting with products or even simply walking into a store. So combining the virtual and the physical. <laughs> David Knoll of SunCloud. SunCloud is a social sound platform that lets anyone create, record, promote, and share their sounds or music on the web and in a simple, accessible, and feature-rich way, a bit like sharing a thought or picture on Facebook. John Alvizio of, of Toby. Toby Technology develops eye tracking and control technology, offering an ever expanding array of solutions from communication aids for people suffering from paralysis to interfaces in consumer electronics. Umesh Mishra of Transform. Transform semiconductor technology vastly minimizes the amount of electricity lost in converting alternative current to direct current in electronic devices. Then Joachim Kuhn of VacuTech. VacuTech's innovative approach to insulation materials reduces energy consumption and enables insulation in places and shapes that were previously impossible to do. And Offer Shapiro of Video. Video's revolutionary video conferencing technology enables high-definition multi-point video conferences on tablets, smartphones, and personal computers. Please join me in giving a hand to this extraordinary group. And why I was so excited about us being able to blend, blend these two together is in the last couple of days, we've had a lot of conversations about Eurozone crises, challenges in the world, all these different problems, and people can feel depressed and out of energy. But when you actually see this, you actually see the only thing greater than the size of the challenges is the tremendous ingenuity that people have and the energy and opportunity behind it. So I thought taking the conversation we had here and providing these 18 points of light in this dark economic clouds was perhaps a way to sort of lighten up all our day. So my congratulations to them. My thanks for the leaders here who, in a sense, create the ecosystem for these kind of, of people to, to, uh, to thrive. And thanks for each of you to being part of this. Thank you very much. <laughs>